Last class, we saw that Sri Ramakrishna is discussing on the various bhavas, various attitudes that has to be adopted to develop a devotional relation to the divine. So, in our human relationships, we find that there are these various categories of love, like Santa, Dasya, Sakya. Vatsalya Madhur, that your love towards some conformed love. There is not much exuberance of emotion, but there is a faith that is working there. So that is a shanta, that very tranquil love. Something superior to that is the dasya, the attitude of a servant towards the master. So it's sin that if the, serv- if the servant is faithful and the master is benevolent, they do develop a wonderful relationship between the servant and the master. Though the fear factor still works there, but the servant do have an emotional bonding with the master and his family. So that's the attitude of the dasa. And with that devotion, he feels like serving the master wholeheartedly. So that's the thing which has to be channelized to the divine. That all the human loves, when it is channelized to the divine, it gets sublimated. So that's a wonderful idea which we find in the Bhakti Shastra. That you need not have to curb your emotions. You need not have to get rid of them and turn yourself into a dry ascetic. Sri Ramakrishna used to say, I don't like the attitude of the dry ascetism. Mother, amake roshe boshe reko. Keep me in good humor. In that, and that's the product of the emotion which has been sublimated. So dasya, be better and so something superlative to that is sakya, where you feel that the loved one is your friend to whom you can open your heart. The fear factor which was working in the dasya is no more there. So that speaks of more intense love. You can relate everything to your friend. It's the same way you can relate everything to the divine. You can as if open yourself up. Nothing has to be hidden. For God, you can open up everything and relate to him just the way The friend relates to a friend. And the emotional bondage of a friend to a friend is something more intense than that of the servant towards the master. And where also the fear factor has gone. Then comes Vatsalya, the love of the parent, especially the mother towards the child. That's still superior because fear factor has gone along with that the expectation has gone. When the mother loves the child, there's no expectation. She is ready to go through all the pains of parenting. She's ready for that. She, it's not a very easy thing to go through that phase of parenting. So much of challenge is there. You have to totally mold your life as per the life of the child. The child's routine becomes your routine. So much sacrifice entails from that. Every, the wants, the needs of the child, 
the mother is always there to take care of. So there, and but in return, she wants nothing. So the fear factor is not there. Here, the mother feels if she doesn't take care, the child is helpless. Similarly, here the devotee becomes greater. God becomes smaller. As if, if you are not there, the God, as if, is helpless. You will, God becomes small. There's a nice story in the gospel in some other place that there were three friends who were passing through the forest and suddenly they saw a tiger in front of them. One of them being, was three of them, both of all the three were scared. One of them being scared told, come, let us run. The second one told that why to run? God is there. Have faith in him. He will save us. The third one told, why to bother him? Come, let us climb the tree. So Sri Ramakrishna is saying the third one is the real devotee. That he doesn't want that God is powerful. Like he can save me. That's the attitude of the master and the servant. The servant thinks the master is always there to take care of him. But here, that you have developed love for God. That why to bother him? That he has given us the faculties that we can climb the tree and save ourselves. Why to bother him? So Sri Ramakrishna is saying that he has developed the love for God. So here also we find that you don't want to bother God. You are as if you are the one who have to take care of him. Just the attitude of uh, Yashoda towards Krishna towards the baby Krishna, Gopala. So that's the attitude of Vatsalya, where God becomes small, the devotee as he becomes big. And then comes the Madhura, that intense love of a paramar for the lover, where the entire society is not, uh, is in, not uh, in any way uh, conforming, is not subscribing to that love. They don't allow that. It is considered as something which is beyond the social norms. But the intensity of that love makes them to meet each other. There's an intense love where we will find all the bhavas have conglomerated. That sometimes we find, that Sri Ramakrishna has mentioned, when the wife is feeding the husband, she as if becomes the mother. Just the way the mother feeds the child, that's the way she feeds her. At that time, the husband has become like the children. And sometimes she relates like a friend where she opens up all her worries, tensions, whatever, that she finds that all everything can be just revealed to him. Uh, that there is that faith working between, that, uh, between them. So that way, like friend, like uh, this, uh, the mother, and of course, that this love, that intensity of this love speaks of what? That this is the love which cannot be compared with any other love. It is something superlative. As Sri Ramakrishna used to say, the wife in a joint family, the wife served the father-in-law, the other members of the family. But when she serves the husband, that serving is something different from that of the others. So that speaks that no other love can be compared with this love. So you will find that as uh, Swami Vivekananda used to say that, that the supreme love uh, is like the three corners of a triangle. There are three aspects of the supreme love. That love knows no fear. As we saw that in the Sakhya it has developed. Love knows no bargaining. As we saw in Bhatsalya, the mother loves the child, wants nothing in return. There's no bargaining in it. And Third is the love knows no contender or comparison. That if when you say I love God, God will make it sure that you love God and God alone. That love cannot be in any way shared with others. So that's, that's been actually indicated by the Madhura. The, 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 the lover's love for, the paramour's love for his lover. So that's the five types of attitudes when channelized towards the divine. The same love which 
makes us fall in love. We say falling in love. That same love can help us to rise in love. Instead of falling in love, we can rise in love. Instead of getting infatuated with the worldly ties, worldly bondage that helps us to go beyond the world ties. The same emotion when the orientation has been sublimated, has been changed. So that's why this is a wonderful idea in the Bhakti Shastra we find that you need not have to curb your emotions. You need not have to curb all the feelings. Just channelize them to the God, to the divine and that will enter in spiritual evolution. So that's the thing which Sri Ramakrishna was discussing in the uh, last section, which we studied in the previous class. So now let's proceed to the conversation of M with Ramakrishna. M, when one sees God, does one see him with these eyes? Master, God cannot be seen with these physical eyes. In the course of spiritual discipline, one gets a love body endowed with love eyes, love ears, and so on. One sees God with those love eyes. One hears the voice of God with those love ears. This is something which he's speaking in such a simple word, but actually is speaking of that in our day-to-day -day life, whatever we love, it is actually our perception, this physical perception, which is getting wired with the emotions. The brain has the emotional centers. The brain has the perceptual centers. When the, you, the mother sees the child, just seeing the child, immediately the child, the perception of the child immediately gets conjoined with the emotional centers in the brain. And that gives you the feeling of love. If due to some psychological aberration, it so happens, it's, it happens to the psychopaths that they don't have any emotions. So the physical center is in no way getting wired with the emotional centers. So the sense that this is mine, this is my house, this is my uh, belonging, it all happens because the emotional center is getting attached to the perceptual center. The same thing happens when I, in my spiritual journey, I start to visualize the divine. I'm trying to visualize in my own vision. I'm trying to vision that whatever the concept of divinity, it may be, maybe it's with form, maybe it's without form. First, when it is a visualization with your willpower, you're trying to visualize then still that love factor, the emotional factor is yet to get conjoined with your visualization. As we proceed in the spiritual journey, the visualization becomes more and more keen. And along with that, gradually, the emotional faculty also starts getting linked with it. The moment that now we find that when I hear some, that popular song, immediately I feel a thrill. But you should read the life of Ramakrishna. Just one line is sufficient of some devotional song he hears, immediately goes to the trance. He sees, he goes to the zoo, sees the lion. We see the lion. Immediately the lion makes him feel that it is the mother's, Mother Durga's Vahana, the carrier of Mother Durga. So the lion, Durga, with the Durga, he's already developed. The divine form he has developed, that emotional bond. That love takes him to the trance. So now you will understand what is this love body. This love body is not this physical body. That through the visualization, the realm which you have created, with that, when you have an emotional bond, then in that body, that visual, with all the visualizations, when you hear some devotional music, when you see something, a divine form, you have the fragrance, you just, the same fragrance as we told that uh, a pujari uh, who has joined the Ramakrishna order, the brahmachari who was ordered, who was asked to do everyday ritualistic worship. At the beginning, the fragrances, the scents the, which we use, 
the uh, for, means the uh, this the what you say the uh, this rose water which we use for cleansing the for this the the picture of the uh, our deity and not only that it's used for uh, this offering everywhere this rose water is used so the shrine has a fragrance of all the scents which has been used and at the beginning he found it's a distraction what is distraction when he was in his house he used to attend the social events like the marriage the wedding ceremony of some of his relative or maybe of his of, her, of his own sister and there he, he had that that all the fragrance he used to smell there and this the fragrance in the shrine distracts him it makes him immediately think of those situations the visualization of those situations sparks in his mind the smell immediately because they are associated with all those worldly things and as he continues the puja a, a wonderful transformation happens after a few months now he goes to the market for shopping and there is some the shop where all those scents are being sold and that fragrance is coming and now the same that in the noisy place in the noisy place like market the fragrance now immediately gives him a very calm feeling a devotion wells up unknowingly what has happened there with the law of association the fragrance has changed now the same fragrance which used to evoke worldly feelings is now evoking divine feeling so this is the love body that the same fragrance that the when you smell when it is giving you a divine smell as if you have developed a divine nose a love nose when any this music there are so many song songs especially in bengali the tagore songs when for the first time we hear without any of our so called uh, evolution spiritual evolution they appear to be worldly love song the same song evokes intense spiritual feeling devotional feeling when the same words will actually decipher a total different meaning you will decipher it you will interpret a total different meaning from those words the same words when you have developed the love for the divine so the same song which appeared to be an ordinary human love song now has become something spiritual so that's you have developed love ears the love eyes so seeing the form the beauty any beauty immediately that the idea which comes it is a god after all that it is not suppose that we are so bra- we are so proud of our the, the, the one who is very beautiful who is very handsome or one is very beautiful they are proud of their beauty but they forget that beauty is something which is a gift of the divine it's not that that they themselves have developed that beauty you may say yes now it is plastic surgery and other things are there but still we know that beauty is something that we uh, cannot uh, design as such it is a gift of the divine so seeing the beauty immediately it makes you think of the divine oh how wonderful this creation is how beautiful the creation is how beautiful he must be who have created it so for him all the emotions have transformed seeing the beauty in the world it no more evokes worldly feeling it evokes the feeling of devotion oh how wonderful is the god's creation how is the god is beautiful and that beauty is being reflected in whatever i see so it's the total sublimation of his emotions that as if that that love body is not something visible it is a visualization which has created that where all the your ears your nose your eyes have all as if transformed you have love ears you have live eyes you have love smell everything has transformed and that's possible when the visualization in spiritual life this visualization is very important the more we can visualize just see the life of ramakrishna as a small child when he is getting his first trance it is not by practicing devotion 
that he was passing uh, down the paddy fields and the sky was dark with the clouds and suddenly he saw that a flock of this the white birds the swans were flying across those black contrast of the black clouds that sublime beauty that took him and transported him and he lost his consciousness so this fix the faculty of intense visualization has something to do with our spiritual journey the one who has that faculty of strong visualization and in the course can develop a tremendous love with a strong visualization is bound to evolve in the spiritual life very fast so that's what sri ramakrishna is saying god cannot be seen with this physical eyes in the course of spiritual discipline one gets a love body endowed with love eyes love ears and so on one sees god with those love eyes one hears the voice of god with those love ears the master continued with this love body the soul communes with god so that's what we were discussing that this is something which you have created by your intense visualization it's not just the way our love and emotions are evoked by your physical perception it's something which speaks of that sublime visualization with which my emotional faculty has got uh, conjoined it has got wired and that's what enters in this love body with this love body the soul communes with god but this is not possible without intense love of god one sees nothing but god everywhere when one loves him with great intensity it is like a person with jaundice one sees everything yellow then one feels i am verily he so when a devotee knows that god it is the god who is this creation is as if the god has become this world is projected as this world then is bound to develop a love for the divine in all the things he sees there is a course is a question of deification the everything gets deified the world doesn't remain just an ordinary world of name and form everything becomes the palpable visible manifestation of the divine just the way when the child is not at home most probably the child has gone to school the mother enters the child's room whatever she sees the child's bed the child's uh, books the child's toys whatever it is there everything reminds her of the child because they are the belongings of the child so that's why we keep the relics that sometimes the one whom we love we will keep some things used by that person with us because that reminds us of that person so the similarly when you have developed love for god the creation which is nothing but the god's projection seeing that the thought of the god is bound to be evoked so when the intense love has developed for god one sees nothing but god everywhere when one loves him with great intensity it is like a person with jaundice who sees everything yellow and then one feels i am verily he a drunkard deeply intoxicated says verily i am kali so when he is totally drunk suddenly you will say that he is no more a devotee of kali he will declare that i am the kali so sir sri ramakrishna jokingly with sri ramakrishna always used to say that the young ones come to me and if i just give them some bland food they won't come it has to be spiced nicely so you will find in his conversation so that's again and again he is spicing up but never it is without those spiritual overtones so he is bringing a worldly example yes we see the drunkard when fully drunk speaking babbling so many things they say sometimes say yes they themselves as he become the god so verily i am kali the gopi is intoxicated with love exclaimed verily i am krishna so this is ekatmata it happens even in our day to day life the small child constantly watching batman will go to the shop and buy the costume which uh, speaks of the, the the costume of the batman he would like to wear wear that dress 
and move around as if he's the Batman. Why it happens? It's the identification with your ideal. So when you love something, you want to get identified with it. When the gopis in, got intoxicated and they're in love, they exclaimed, Verily, I am Krishna. As Sri Ramakrishna used to say, Je jar chinta kare, sheta shatta pai. The one about whom you are constantly thinking, your nature will be tinged by all the qualities of that person. So when you're thinking of God, you're bound to develop those qualities that get developed the qualities which are divine. You have to, and you fill that, that oneness with the divine as the ekatamata. So that's the idea behind our worship. That there are two words in Sanskrit is vigraha and ahamgraha. Vigraha means I go to the shrine as a novice when I've just started my spiritual practice. The idea is God is sitting there, God is in the deity. I am separate from the divine. All the good qualities, I, ad- I just attribute it to the deity. And I say, I am the sinner. I am the one who, is, who has no as such good qualities. And there only we are satisfied just by attributing all the good qualities to the deity. That way, it doesn't help in spiritual life. As we grow in our spiritual journey, all those divine qualities which we attribute to the deity has to be internalized. Unless we internalize, unless we have that sense of identity with the divine, the spiritual progress can never happen. So that's why Sri Ramakrishna hated the word that I am the sinner, that you have taken the name of God. How can you be the sinner? The name of the God is supposed to cleanse your system. You should have such a faith that just once taking the name of the Lord is bound to cleanse you. The Lord name of the Lord is so powerful because when you're thinking of the divine, other things are bound to vanish. Your mind is supposed to be tinged by the divine and you have to, you are bound to develop a sense of ekatmata. And that is the thing which Sri Ramakrishna is indicating that when, as Sri Ramakrishna in some other context has mentioned, that if you say you are divine, if you are a devotee, and you have no such, you have not developed all those qualities, divine qualities, then how can you say you are a devotee? It is just like a person, a pauper, just saying, just pointing to a rich man says, I am actually his son. If you are his son, then you are bound to inherit if you have not inherited the riches of that rich man, it itself shows that you are not the son. The son is bound to entail the riches of that rich man. So if you say that you are the son of God, then what, what have you inherited? You have to inherit all the divine qualities. Then only you can claim that you are the son of God. So it is our inheritance which speaks of our devotion. So unless this internalization happens, which gives us a sense of ekatmata, know it for certain, we are yet to advance in spiritual life. So with the intoxication that comes when in extreme love, when our mind can never do multitasking, it can have only one thought at a time. When we, when we do multitasking, actually the mind is jumping from one activity to the other at a very fast sequence. But it is never at a time, it's never uh, can uh, give attention to two more than one thing. So the one who is intensely absorbed in the divine, thinking of the divine, how can the other thoughts come? They're bound to fall off. And when you intensely think of the divine and all the divine qualities Naturally, that's the thing which imbibes you. You get, you get imbibed by them. And that's give you the sense of identification with, with the divine. So this, it is possible with that intense love. In intense love, the lo- intense love alone speaks of spontaneous meditation. The one whom you love, when you love intensely, you will find you can never forget him. The mother can never forget of the child. It's always thinking, whatever she may be doing, is thinking of the child. The love entails spontaneous meditation. 
and when that spontaneous contemplation is there other thoughts are bound to fall off and that gives the sense of identity and that's what sri ramakrishna is saying the gopi is intoxicated with love exclaim verily i am krishna the one whom you love love you get identified with him one who thinks of god day and night beholds him everywhere it is like a man seeing flames on all sides after he has gazed fixedly at one flame for some time so this is just an example he is giving that if you are looking at a flame for some time and now you close your eyes you will still still with the closed eyes as if you will see the flame so it is always there with you so one who is constantly contemplating of the divine the mind has got absorbed with the divine now everywhere whatever he is looking at is it same the divine will be seen in each and every object as in the scriptures it has been mentioned yatra when you go to that state of spiritual evolution yatra yatra mano yati tatra tatra param padam drishyate you see that the highest state of your consciousness in whatever you see the world gets as if deluged in consciousness as sri ramakrishna used to say in, say has said in some other place that when there is a profuse rainfall when there is a profuse rainfall and the grass gets drenched the grassland gets drenched with water it is soaked with water in the same way i see the entire world soaked with consciousness it's not some poetry when a person of spiritual attainment goes to the realization and comes back he sees the consciousness and consciousness alone behind the entire existence so that's being indicated that as sri chaitanya mahaprabhu also used to say jaha jaha netra pore taha taha krishna sphure that wherever my eyes fall i see krishna popping up from there so that's the thing happens when in the we have that intense we have developed that intense a devotion for the divine one who thinks of god day and night beholds him everywhere it is like a man seeing flames on all sides after he has gazed fixedly at one flame for some time but that isn't the real flame flashed through em's mind so it is not a real flame so similarly are you hallucinating seeing the divine everywhere so that's what uh, is a very interesting episode in swami vivekananda's life swami vivekananda was lecturing was delivering his lecture on vedanta and he was speaking the same thing that a man of realization sees that on that non dual conscious principle everywhere the world for him becomes flooded with consciousness so then someone from the audience stood up and told asked just uh, commented on that statement that swami ji it's a very nice way of hypnotizing that you go on suggesting a person that the world is nothing but conscious principle and that suggestion starts working so intensely on you at last he gets hypnotized he really feels as if the world is consciousness the world of name and form vanishes so it is a nice way of hypnotizing why nice way because that makes him forget all the challenges of life all the dualities of life and that though it is hypnotization it is good so it helps you to transcend the sorrows and sufferings of life but after all it is a hallucination it's not real the suggestions have started making you hallucinate and immediately some swami vivekananda retorted back madam you are already under hallucination i am just dehallucinating you you are already being hypnotized i am just dehypnotizing you that the lady asked the lady actually said that it is a nice way of hypnotizing and swami ji is reply was madam you are already hypnotized when i say you are atman you are brahman it is a process of dehypnotization what a wonderful answer same something similar on those lines sri ramakrishna he will be now commenting he read the m m actually was silently thinking but that isn't the real flame flash through aims mind sri ramakrishna who could read a man's in most thought said one doesn't lose consciousness by thinking of him who is all spirit 
all consciousness. Shivnath once remarked that too much thinking about God confounds brain. Thereupon I said to him, how can one become unconscious by thinking of consciousness? So now here we may say that we do have so many examples where too much think it, one trying to contemplate too much have got deranged. Then isn't it true that what Shivnath told do uh, have some fact behind it? That Shivnath once remarked that too much thinking about God confounds the brain. And Sri Ramakrishna is replying that how can one become unconscious by thinking of consciousness? So here this the catch is you have to read the words of Sri Ramakrishna just as it is being intended to say that how can one become unconscious by thinking of consciousness? What happens when a novice is trying to exert overdo? He's actually not thinking of consciousness. His mind is constantly getting distracted into other things. He's trying to force to something which is sublime. So his mind is full of struggle. It's not constantly thinking of the conscious principle. It is actually full of distractions. Again and again, trying, he's trying to force and to go to that contemplation. So it speaks of overexertion, which is not, he's not being allowed actually to stay in that state because of his state of mind is bahuvritti. The vagaries is the state of his mind. He's struggling. But the one who has gone beyond that struggle, whose mind is always in that divine plan, for him there is no question of this friction. And such a mind, which has already got rid of all the distractions and is always contemplating on the divine. The thought has become a spontaneity. It can never derange him. It can actually, it actually speaks of more and more overhauling of the personality. When the, all the struggle comes, all the question of derangement comes when I'm struggling to keep my mind in that consciousness. But once I have succeeded, when the struggle has gone, there is no question of mental derangement. I can go on with a spontaneous concentration throughout the day without my mind getting deranged. Actually, it will make my mind more pure because all the bias will fall off. What I see will be my will be the real vision. Just that example which we give again and again, that, that when in this world, we can never see anything correctly because of the, our biases a stump lying in the corner of the park. The police thinks it's a thief. The thief thinks it's the police. A lover thinks it's to be his beloved. The mother, the son, the child thinks it's to be the mother. The mother thinks it's to be the child. What it speaks, this exam, common example in Vedanta, that our bias never allows us to see the thing as it is. The one who is thinking of consciousness and consciousness alone, all the vagaries have fallen off. All the biases have fallen off. He becomes as if omniscient. He can see the thing as it is. So how can uh, the question of deranging of the brain come? Actually, we are deranged. He is never deranged. The derangement happens only when we are trying to imitate it. a spiritually illumined soul who is spontaneously contemplating. His contemplation has become spontaneous. He is not exerting himself. We try to imitate and the question of exertion comes. My mind cannot stay there. It's again and again coming back. So that overdoing, that exertion, do can result in derangement. But the one who has already become an adept, whose mind is always spontaneously in that domain of this, this uh, contemplation, where he's all, always thinking of God and God alone, there cannot be any derangement. Actually, it speaks of a mind which is free from all derangement. We are mad. We are not seeing the things, seeing the things correctly. But he never have any sort of delusion. He can never have any false steps because his biases has fallen off. So that's what Sri Ramakrishna is saying that one doesn't lose consciousness by thinking of him who is all spirit, all consciousness. Shivnath once remarked that too much thinking about God confounds the brain. Thereupon I said to him, how can one become unconscious by thinking of consciousness? Aim, yes, sir. I realize that. 
It isn't like thinking of an unreal object. How can a man lose his intelligence if he always fixes his mind on him whose very nature is eternal intelligence? So here we find M have realized the import of the Ramakrishna's word. And in response, we find master is extremely happy. So master replies, master with pleasure, it is through God's grace that you understand that. The doubts of the mind will not disappear without his grace. Doubts do not disappear without self-realization. So these two sentences are very important. The doubts of the mind will not disappear without his grace. That's one. And again, doubts do not disappear without self-realization. The first line speaks of a novice who has faith, who is yet to go to the realization, who is yet to have any spiritual realization, but has tremendous faith in the words of the Guru, of the scriptures. So that itself is a grace. The thing which you have not realized, to have faith in those words, it speaks of grace. The divine grace is as if on you. Most of the people just cannot believe. They always doubt. And if you have developed that faith in the words of the scriptures and of the words of the spiritual preceptor, that itself speaks of the grace. With that, the spiritual journey starts. So again, we should say that this that faith doesn't mean this means believing blindly. What does faith mean? Faith means that the words of the scripture, the words of my spiritual preceptor, the belief that they are true, but somehow my understanding is not yet up to that. There is a gap in understanding. So if I at the very beginning uh, just totally uh, just uh, neglect them, disapprove them, just say they are just all rubbish. There is no question of really trying to understand the, sp the real import of those words. Just the way I cannot explain a small child, the, all the scientific theories. First, I have to say, these are all true, but you can understand only when you go to the higher grades. You have to go to the preliminary education to understand all those spiritual uh, all those scientific laws which has been discovered. And the child has faith that yes, that this world of science is something which speaks of the, the facts. He has faith. He's yet to really uh, understand them uh, through uh, the physical, I mean, through experimentation because he doesn't have that knowledge. He doesn't have the sophistication of that knowledge to prove all those facts which has been spoken of. But through faith, as he gradually progresses in his academic education, at last when he goes to the higher grades, he what he had faith, now he finds that they are, they, they, they are easily comprehensible because his knowledge is now up to that. So faith speaks of that. That if I just at the very beginning say they are all nonsense, they're all rubbish, and then I then brush them off, then there's no question of ever really progressing in my spiritual journey by gradually developing an intellectual conviction what what has been spoken of in the scriptures. So that's why he's saying it's, it's a lot of grace for the novice to get rid of the doubts. Here, when Aim responded to the master's word, here also we find that he is the one who is a devout, his aspirant who is yet to realize, but he has faith in the master words. He is just conforming to what he has said. And that's why Sri Ramakrishna is very happy. He says he knows very well. It's not that easy. It's through God's grace that you understand that the doubts of the mind will not disappear without his grace. You need Shraddha as a novice. And when you go to the realization, that's the real, uh, what you say, that the... Um, uh, conviction, the real conviction comes from realization. That's when you go to the realization. That's the second sentence. Doubts do not disappear 
without self-realization. So we, when I have faith, then also the doubts have disappeared to a certain extent. I am not questioning the authenticity of what has been told. I humbly accept, I don't understand, but I have faith. So there is no question of disbelief. So the doubts of the mind will not disappear without his grace as a novice. And when I've gone to the realization, that speaks of the real, that speaks of the uh, real conviction. Doubt do not disappear without self-realization. So that's the thing the master is saying. That it is through God's grace that you, have, you can understand that. But one need not fear anything if one has received the grace of God. It is rather easy for a child to stumble if he holds his father's hand. But there can be no such fear if the father holds the child's hand. A man does not have to suffer anymore if God in his grace removes his doubts and reveals himself to him. So now immediately the question will arise. Then what can I do? If God's grace is there, then only the question of going beyond doubt is there. Otherwise, I'm bound to have all those uh, doubts in my mind. It's quite okay. I have no, I have no hand over it. So the next thing after saying this, what Sri Ramakrishna says, that is important. But this grace descends upon him only after he has prayed to God with intense yearning of heart and practiced spiritual discipline. So that, that's the question of that faith comes here. The grace descends on him through faith, one who has resorted to this practice. Then does this practice take us to the realization? Then realization is something created by my practice. It is not something real. It's what uh, that lady devotee told to Swami Vivekananda, that holds true then. That it is the hallucination which through my constant suggestion I have created. So here we have to realize that what? That the, all my practice is actually not helping me to attain something. All my practice is at last to ensure, to entail a let go, a surrender. And then the realization comes by itself. So all the practices are having something negative implication. As in the Yoga Sutra, very nicely it has been mentioned that all the practices are secondary. The real thing is that all the practices actually helps us to remove the ignorance. And then the revelation happens spontaneously. As in the Yoga Sutra, that the example is given that there is a dam which is not allowing the water of the river to come to the field, to the uh, agricultural land. So you cannot cultivate the land because the water cannot come, the dam is there. So to bring the water you have to do, you have to just make a small hole in the dam. And the water will just start in torrents. It will start flowing into your this agricultural field. So just all the practice is just to remove. You don't have to bring the water by effort. The water will come by flow by itself. Just remove the barrier, the remove the barrier of ignorance. That's what Swami Vivekananda used to say, that religion is the manifestation of the divinity already in man. It is already there. You have to manifest. All the practice is just to remove the obstacles. So his, it is after all, it is his grace through which everything happens. But for the grace to descend on us, we have to that yearn for God intensely. You have to pray to God. To understand this, let us just uh, refer to one, Ramakrishna's analogy. Very nice uh, analogy he, uh, he, has he has cited in some other portion of the gospel. What's that? A bird was sitting on the mast of a ship and the ship was on the deep waters of the ocean. Now the bird felt like flying to the shore. It flew to the east. It got tired. So it couldn't find any land, came back, sat on the mast to take rest. Again, it, when it got a little energy, it got vitalized, 
It went to the west. Again, it got tired, couldn't find any land. Again came and sat on the mast, went to the north, went to the south. At last, it was totally exhausted, no energy. Then came that resignation. Let the ship take me where it takes. Now it sat quietly on the mast. So all our practices is just to make our wings tired. Then that real resignation comes. Now when I say that I have Sharanagati, it is just mere word. I don't know what Sharanagati is, what real resignation is. For that practice is required. Through practice, when you get exhausted, when you find that nothing is happening, then suddenly you will find that all the doors, the portals open up. The spiritual uh, realization comes in a flash. In the life of Ramakrishna itself, you will find that when by intense yearning, he couldn't have the, the vision of the divine, at last out of frustration, he took the sword from the mother's hand and was about to that commit suicide. He was about to cut his own throat, saying that, What's the need of that life? What's the use of that life in which I cannot see you? And it's that's the moment when he was totally frustrated. The tremendous frustration that nothing is happening. And then there was a flood of illumination. So when that utter frustration happens, when all your efforts seems to fail, then that resignation comes. And for that entails in spiritual illumination. Even in our day-to-day -day life, we will find that those who practice meditation, they will find that days after days, the meditation appears to be so monotonous. Nothing is as if happening. And one day he sits for meditation and suddenly, though he may not get the highest spiritual realization, suddenly he finds he has enjoyed a type of tranquility, calmness. And a certain bliss also he has experienced. And now he thinks or she thinks Oh, now I have attained it. I'm going to have it every day, whenever I sit for meditation. And the next day again he sits, nothing happens. And who knows again when it will happen. Why it happens? That when with expectation I'm practicing again and again, nothing happens. And when the practice, uh, just I do habitually, it has become my habit. And as I'm frustrated, as nothing is happening, I just sit for my practice without any expectation one day. And suddenly I find the bliss is emanating. The mind has become tranquil. What has happened? The expectation has fallen off for the time being. And when I have that bliss, that tranquility, again, the expectation grows. Oh, this is the thing. Now I'm going to have every day. Again, it is gone. So this hide and seek goes on for long in our spiritual journey. That's Kripa is something which is not in our hand. We don't know when we get tired and that resignation comes. But when it comes, the relation comes. Again, it may go. This hide and seek may go on for how long, we don't know. At last, for the real resignation to come, without, again, this coming, without the, that's what you said, our self-effort springing back, springing up, again, springing back. It, it subdues forever, bringing you that, uh, let go, the resignation. And then the bliss is something which no one can take away from you. So it's a long journey, but know it for certain, it is a grace and grace alone which entails in spiritual realization. That example which we give again and again, when a man has climbed up the tree and it is holding onto the branches, to fall, there is no need for any, there is no effort required. He just have to release the hold the gravitation will pull him down. Just have to release the hold. So we are holding onto this, this world of name and form. And sometimes we get disgusted with it and we think, now let me hold on to God. It is just like leaving the hold of one branch which was infested with a lot of insects. It was uh, biting me. I was uh, totally uh, at I was not at ease at all. I was in pain. I just released the hold of that branch to hold onto another branch, nomenclaturing it as caught, but I'm still holding. So that doesn't allow me to fall. At last, the let go has to ensure. You just have to leave hold of all the branches, whether you nomenclature it God or as word, just leave it hold. 
And that happens through that spiritual practice at last. Just the way the gravitation pulls us down, the grace pulls us up to our spiritual identity. So that's the grace is working. Just the way the, this gravitation is working downwards, grace is always working upwards to make us identified with our spiritual essence. But as we are holding onto the world or holding onto the concept of divinity, that never it happens. So it's through practice, through practice at last, that let go has to come. And then the grace works. So thus, thus you will understand that there is a link between the self-effort and grace. That the grace can never dawn in without that self-effort. That self-effort has to at last bring that perfect resignation for the grace to work through you. As Sri Ramakrishna used to say that the, the wind of the grace is always blowing. It is a wall of ego in which it gets obstructed. So when the wind is blowing, if there's a wall, you cannot, if you're on the other side of the world, you cannot enjoy the wind. The world has to, wall has to fall off. So it is a wall of ego, which doesn't allow the grace, the wind of grace, which is always blowing. So that ego has to fall off. And that speaks of the Sharanagati. As long as I think through practice, I, have, will, I will get the, I will achieve the goal. The ego is working. It is I, my practice, which is going to take me to the goal. That ego is still working. It has to fall off. When that real, that realization comes, and ultimately the realization comes, with my practice, nothing is going to happen. Then that resignation comes. You leave the hole. And then it immediately takes to that realization. So now, again, let us read those lines. We will find that what Sri Ramakrishna is saying do make some sense. But one need not fear anything if one has received the grace of God. One has received, there is no, it is rather easy for a child to stumble if he holds his father's hand. So here it says, when we, you are holding, trying to hold to the divine, that you are a nomenclature, one branch as God you are trying to hold. So that is, the ch this child, is, child can still stumble if he holds to the father's hand. But there can be no fear if the father holds the child's hand. So when the ego has fallen off, you are not in any way trying to hold onto the father's hand. You know that still that you may lose your hand, your grip may loosen and you may fall. So you have allowed the father to hold you. So your self foot has fallen off. Father, then even if you stumble, you won't fall because father is holding you. So one to him that resignation has came and who has allowed the divine to work through him. So there is no question of fall. So a man does not have to suffer anymore if God in his grace removes his doubts and reveals himself to him. So that's then this question, but how that grace can happen? But this grace depends upon him only after he has prayed to God with intense yearning of heart and practiced spiritual discipline. It's just like the father is insisting that let me hold your hand, let me hold the hand of the child. And the child just goes on uh, disobeying, says, no, says, I will hold your hand. And father finding the child so insistent allows the child to hold the hand of the father and the child now and then trips and then the child realizes that however he may try to maintain his balance, he may fall off as long as he's trying to hold the father's hand. And now this through his effort that realization has dawned. So now he allows the father, okay, you hold my hand. So then there is no question of falling. So that effort do has a meaning. That disobedience is okay if it takes you to the realization. If disobedience doesn't make us realize the truth, as Sri Ramakrishna used to say, that the camel goes on eating th these thorny bushes. It bleeds, but it will still go on eating the thorny bushes. That's the thing which he's indicating in our lives. That through our ego and our self-effort, again and again we fail, but we can never let go of the ego. Again, we hold on to the ego. That is like the camels thriving on the thorny bush and bleeding. Once the ego falls off, the God is bound to take hold. And then we need not fear. Just in this life, in this world, you just observe. 
a small child is born born helpless can do nothing but see the god's creation god's creation is such that all these parents immediately feel the need to take care of the child god is god works through the parents to take care of the one who is really helpless the moment the child starts feeling that i can do myself now the parents will be distancing themselves there's a nice story that one day a devotee was passing down the street this is in the, in the gospel only this story is there and as he was deeply contemplating on the divine he was oblivious of the surrounding now as he was walking down the street a washerman has actually spread out the washed clothes to dry and this man as he was oblivious of the surrounding didn't notice he stumbled on the washed clothes to just uh, to leave his uh, this foot, uh, footprints on the cloth so they became dirty so naturally the washerman was angry now he came running to hit this devotee he was coming from a distance uh, with a stick in his hand to hit this was so he was in rage that he, this man has spoiled the clothes i have uh, with so much of effort i have cleaned and he has spoiled them and seeing that the washerman is going to beat the devotee in the heaven this is a story which ramakrishna is interpreted as a funny story in the heaven the vishnu who was sitting beside lakshmi the vishnu got up and lakshmi asked why you got up where are you going no 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 my devotee my devotee i have to save him and this washerman is a ignorant person he doesn't know his state he is going to hit him i have to save my devotee and lakshmi was just was uh, lakshmi knew that okay then vishnu will uh, is going to save his devotee but in no time vishnu came back lakshmi asked, what happened you were going to save your devotee what happened and then vishnu replied no my devotee has picked up a stone he has picked up a stone to hit that person means as he is coming running with a so now vishnu comes back so the moment that our own effort comes god is not there anymore to help us that's the intention of the story so through our life struggle at last that realization should come so that the that is the importance of the struggle that the struggle at last should make us realize with our own effort nothing is going to happen and that pure resignation comes that's why in bhagavad gita you find the 18th chapter sri krishna is speaking of sharanagati mame kam shar sarva dharman parityajya mame kam sharanam vraja then what was the need of speaking of all these yogas in the 17 chapters the previous 17 chapters he was speaking of karma yoga gyana yoga raja yoga bhakti yoga everything he was speaking and at last he is saying sharanagati so it again speaks the same thing the first you practice all those things and then the real sharanagati comes and when that comes then only i am there to help you out ग्रेसिन we have to pray to god we have to have intense yearning of heart and do practice the spiritual discipline so in colloquial bengali they say the word kripa means kri plus pa means kri means karo in bengali karo means to do something if you do something pa means pabe karo tobe pabe if you do something then you will get it doesn't come just uh, uh, just you are just uh, nice to sleeping and thinking that oh in time god will come and grace me not that way you have to do something you have to endeavor karo tobe pabe that's what's the kripa kri plus pa karo tobe pabe you have to endeavor and then only the grace dance so there's a wonderful balance between these two purushakara and kripa that's what sri ramakrishna is indicating here so with this we stop our discussion today we'll continue with the next portion again in the next class thank you all namaskars